something really unexpected happened today. After the far right kicked off across the country, a judge decided to name the suspect in the Southport stabbing case, all because of the lies that were spreading like wildfire across social media that he was a Muslim immigrant, which kicked off days of ugly, alcohol fueled riots across the country. Figures like Tommy Robinson, Katie Hopkins were at the heart of it, peddling conspiracy theories about why there wasn't more information out there about the attacker. And that was then amplified by Nigel Farage, who is, of course, now an MP. He went onto X, or Twitter as I still call it, to ask, was the truth being withheld? That post has been viewed six million times. In the end, the judge decided that the only way to combat this misinformation and the public disorder was to name the 17-year-old attacker. But will this really calm the mob? Or will they see this as a vindication? I'm Liz Bates, and today on The Daily, we'll be asking how misinformation online can suddenly erupt into violence in the streets. And what on earth are we going to do about it? So first of all, let's speak to Tom Cheshire, who is our data and forensics correspondent. The first thing that I really want to ask you is part of what seems to have been really driving the riots that we've seen uh, in the streets in Southport, first of all, but in, in other areas of the country as well, is this idea that information is being purposely withheld from the public, in particular on the suspect. Now, that position has changed today. We couldn't name him. And today, the judge has said that he can be named. So just, you know, explain that to us. Yeah, I mean, it, it took us by surprise. You know, we were talking about why these things, you know, information was being withheld. You're right. And it was being withheld for a reason because this is a 17-year-old. It's a child. They legally can't be identified. Um, sometimes that can be changed, but certainly not before it comes to a court. Um, what we've heard today is that that has changed. And it's extraordinary, actually, the... Um, I think there's two things here. I mean, the first of all, it was specifically to address the misinformation that had been flying around, which I can't think of happening. Now, we have to because, caveat because that. Because he was being, there were names going around online that were false. Yeah, and not just names, questions of status in terms of immigration status, um, speculation about religion, which we still don't know, actually. People um, were saying he was a Muslim that had come over on yeah, a boat. Yeah, and we've known for a while that those aren't true. It's frustrating for us, for instance, because we do our own investigation. We have a good idea of who the suspect is, but because he's a child, because we want the judicial process to work, to be preserved, um, for trials to go off, for justice to be done and also to be seen to be done, that has to be protected. Th this is different. And, and I think it's really important that actually he's a, he was about to turn 18. He is about to turn 18 in six days time. I think if this was a 15 year old, a 16 year old, I don't think it would have been lifted. But given that he was going to be named in six days' time. Anyway, that would have happened automatically. Uh, the Daily Mail asked for this to happen, and the judge actually said, uh, he, he listened to this for 20 minutes, and then he said, um, this, is it all right? I'll read it out in full, actually. By continuing to prevent full reporting at this stage, it has the disadvantage of allowing others who are up to mischief to continue to spread misinformation in a vacuum and runs the risk that when the information does become publicly available in six days' time, when he turns 18, um, that will provide an additional excuse for a fresh round of public disorder. Allowing full reporting will undoubtedly remove some of the misreporting as the identity of the defendant. So it's specifically to address that misinformation. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure where that, what we think of that in terms of it seems disorder is influencing the judicial process here. But again, I, I point back at this six days time. This isn't, um, you know, a year or so to go. But it, it's an extraordinary, it extraordinary, extraordinary thing to happen, right? I think. I mean, you know, you looking at all this unfold, you kind of think, well, an angry far right mob has taken to the streets. And so a, a judge has felt that that. Yeah, they had to change the legal process because and he of says that. he said and the judge said, "I accept it is it is exceptional. This is exceptional, and that is a result of what we have seen in terms of the disorder on the streets, which you know has been fueled by that misreporting, that misinformation about his uh, religion, about his immigration status." That said, I don't think this is going to do anything to quell some of those voices we've seen. We've already seen figures on the hard right, the populist right, however you want to call it, tweeting about this, uh, blaming the media. Turning Point UK, which is a right-wing organisation, said the establishment and the media gaslit us once again. That's pretty vague. I don't know what they think we're gaslighting them about in that case, especially when, as the judge says, that specific reporting.
interesting about him being an illegal immigrant who came over on a small boat is obviously false. And it's good it is out there. And I think that does help in terms of what we, you know, we can talk about transparency and things like that. At least it is out there. But I, I, I think that doubling back is going to make, no, I think it's going to make it worse, to be honest. I don't think the people that were stoking up these tensions are now going to say, okay, we hold our hands up. We were completely wrong. He's British. He was born here. He's not a Muslim. We'll take a step back. I think they will say, and they're already saying, first of all, they've, They've pushed a judge to release more information, so they'll feel like it's a victory. And secondly, they're going to say, well, look, this is a young black man with a foreign-sounding name. We were right all along. This is about immigration. Yeah, I think completely agree with that. Um, broadly, it is going to fuel it, and immigration will become the topic, even though the son of immigrants, and this is people objecting you know, pretty much to the, as you say, a foreign-sounding name, the color of someone's skin. We're in a bit of a... We're in new territory here, aren't we? Yeah. A, a judge talking about misinformation as a reason to release the name of a suspect. Yeah, it does feel like there's a trap doors just open and hovering above before plunging through. This is this is very, very new. And I think it only just solidifies that narrative in those places on the internet um, that this was being withheld. And because we've marched and because we've protested in the loosest possible sense, because um, even if it started as a protest, it certainly didn't end like that. Um, this judge has changed the rule. Well, he hasn't changed the rule, sorry. He's made an exception. The rules still remain. But um, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary place to be. I, I can't see it calming things down at all. We talk a lot about misinformation, and especially with these riots, we've been talking about the role of misinformation. I see bits of it kind of come up on my timeline, but obviously I'm not mm. hugely engaged with it, so I don't see the whole thing. It gives a sense of what it looks like and how it spreads. Yeah, I think I think misinformation is not a great word in general. I think it's been bandied around. I think I think in its worst sense, it has this idea that the media, especially the mainstream media, are sort of the inquisitors looking for heresy, and it's for policing political beliefs, which is absolutely not what it should be about. It should be applied very, very strictly. And I think we saw that, especially during um, the COVID pandemic, people talking about lockdowns. And I think there was a lot of you know, mainstream media saying X, Y, Z, and that was interpreted by people who were, say, anti-lockdown, trying to answer, ask questions about it as, I think that misinformation label was applied too readily, and it is often applied too readily. Um, in this case, I think it is different. It's when it's something which is identifiably false. And in this case, it's a really easy example because we do know enough details to say that actually when someone's saying this, uh, the attacker was an immigrant, we know that is not true. That is misinformation for whatever reason. There are different ways, uh, different purposes perhaps why you might have that misinformation. It might be deliberate. It might be accidental. It might be for monetary gain in terms of just getting clicks because that is, you know, a valid business model in terms of the attention economy that is social media. Yeah. Um, in this specific instance, you had sort of a mixture of all those things, I think. The and things it, that I saw that could have potentially sparked this, but you can tell me yeah. uh, if this was right. It was people like Andrew Tate, Tommy Robinson, I think Katie Hopkins was out there as well. And they were sort of, uh, they were angry and they, I think, were naming people and they were spreading this idea that it was a Muslim person or it was somebody that had come over uh, on a small boat. Yeah, was that the catalyst? Yeah, and I think it, it, that was a that was a catalyst. And there's a few overlapping things with it. Um, it happens straight after the attack. Before you know, when the news breaks, when you get the alert on your phone, immediately you start seeing this, and it's from accounts, um, especially on X, formerly Twitter, um, which do push an anti-immigrant narrative. They push the idea of this um, great replacement theory, the conspiracy theory that. Uh, the government or the World Economic Forum is trying to replace the native-born populations of various countries. Um, that's a trope that's always being pushed. And whatever the news is, they'll push it again, as they did in this case. I think you're right. There, there's a, there were certain accounts that pushed it. Andrew Tate's got such a huge following. And when he says that, you know, that really reverberates. And so... I, th I think that's what we have seen over the last few years is a lot of these disparate groups, especially because X has sort of removed that moderation. They have this connective tissue now, which is why you get when Tommy Robinson has a march in London. Uh, now Katie Hopkins is there. Lawrence Fox is there. This is sort of people who maybe wouldn't have been associated with it. That comes under the free speech banner, uh, sort of some of it's anti-vax, some of it's, again, that sort of conspiracy theory. These are tribes who 
are not necessarily all aligned on everything. They don't agree on absolutely everything. I think what they probably do all agree on is that there is a mainstream narrative and they are fighting back against it. The thing that I, I want to ask you is why does it feel like it's suddenly kind of erupted onto the streets? I mean, we've seen these marches before, but it, it feels different in the past week, couple of weeks. What do you think is going on? I think, you know, a lot of the things we talked about during the general election in terms of where we are in terms of services, opportunities, the economies of these sorts of places, I think there's absolutely a driver. But I, then I think there is also that Overton window, you know, the idea of what's acceptable to say politically. I think that has shifted. We did some stuff on this in terms of um, how the language of the far right has been sort of co-opted by a lot of politicians. So the idea of an invasion um, when it comes to small boats, which, you know, I, I think everyone would agree, you know, the Labour Party agrees that small boats is an issue. But to describe it as an invasion, I think is a bit much. It certainly isn't that in terms of numbers. But this very emotive language, which used to be the preserve of the far right, is now in the mainstream. You know, once you have that talk about it, people can get fed up. They can look at what they've been told, you know, for the last year that um, the boats were going to be stopped, manifestly have not been stopped. It was put front and centre as a political issue and it has not been resolved at all. And people might, you know, justifiably say, look, you said you would fix this. You haven't fixed yeah. this. Give us a sense of you look at you look at um, a lot of the stuff online. Can you see how a normal person living a normal life would start to look at this stuff and get drawn into it. You can see a potential journey from being legitimately mistrustful of mm. some of our institutions because there are people... Hundred, we should be sceptical. We should like, be sceptical. Scepticism is great. Absolutely. And it's not, you know, and, and there are many, many examples in this country and across the world where, uh, you know, governments have lied to populations and, and trusted institutions have failed um, failed people. You look at the post office scandal mm. in this country and the infected blood 100%. scandal and all of that. And you can see how people would start from that position yeah. uh, and get to somewhere that is actually... I think that's a really good point. Conspiracy you know, theory yeah, you, based. Because it does happen. There have been these huge failures and we have seen trust go down as a result. And that's worrying for us as a society, not in a sort of, um, you know, woe is us sort of way, but, you know, effective societies have high levels of trust. It's great for economies. It's great for all sorts of things. And if you start to lose that, if people don't trust each other, yeah. that's really bad. And there have been those failures of trust. I, I think that's a really, really important point. This doesn't happen in a vacuum right. at all. Thank you very much for speaking to us today. Thank you. That seems like a good moment to take a little break. And when we come back, we'll be asking the director of the campaign group, Hope Not Hate, what the long-term solutions are to tackling, taking on, eliminating the far right. So now we're going to speak to Joe Mulhall. He's the director of research at Hope Not Hate. He really understands what is driving this kind of latest version of uh, far-right activity that we're seeing. So maybe he can give us some answers on how to deal with it in the short term, of course, policing and in the long term. And in terms of the government response, I mean, obviously today they're talking about and they'll be thinking about internally policing uh, primarily and how they police these riots and there's been a bit of discussion of kind of banning certain groups possibly the English Defence League is a term that's been banded around how far do you think that will go in dealing with this with this problem and beyond that is there much longer term work that needs to be done to address this the discussions of banning the english defence league are actually quite confusing in the sense that the english defence league doesn't exist as an organisation that hasn't done for many years it was formed back in 2009 by tommy robinson or real name stephen lennon he left the organisation in 2013 it limped on for several years but you know while there might be the odd facebook group claiming this that and the other the organisation does not exist what we're actually seeing here is a much more decentralised set of far-right activists. They don't claim to be part of a single organisation. They don't have a name. They don't have a badge. They don't have a branch structure or a, a membership list. This is thousands of individuals all over the country engaging in forms of far-right activism, consuming far-right information and creating far-right information, but in a decentralised way. And this means that talk of banning the English Defence League is not going to have an effect on the events that we've seen in the last few days. 
is that a bit worrying in a sense? Because, you know, you see people at the top of government talking about the English Defence League. And actually, you know, I follow a lot of this stuff online and I recognise the picture that you paint much more than this idea that there's one organisation uh, controlling everything that's going on. So at the top of government and in our security services, is there a bit of a misunderstanding, actually, of the current picture of how the far right is operating? Well, I can't talk for what the security services analysis is, but there is absolutely, I mean, we've seen numerous politicians come out and lose commentators in the media in the last few days calling for bans on things like the English Defence League, which does betray a lack of understanding of what the contemporary far right looks like, how it mobilises, how it organises, and the effect that that has. You can't ban something that doesn't exist. And actually, you know, when we saw 20,000 or even 30,000 people on the streets of London last weekend in support of Tommy Robinson, there was no name for that grouping. There was no organisation. So what does a ban look like there? Who are you arresting? Are you arresting 30,000 people or are you arresting anyone that shouts pro-Tommy Robinson slogans? This is being motivated by the hatred and the politics and the anti-Muslim prejudice that is being espoused by Tommy Robinson. But banning the English Defence League isn't going to stop that. So certainly not in the digital age. It does, doesn't really make sense. So I think if we're going to talk about next steps, we need to have that analysis in place before we start calling for the prescription of organisations that don't exist. And on that issue of next steps, yes, the government will be focusing on the immediate thing will be policing, of course. But beyond that, is the work that we need to do in our communities to try to dial down these tensions? And what would that look like? Hugely. I think this is going to be a really long-term process about what, how is it that we make sure that communities that live next to each other and with each other can get on, work and live together and, and live in a cohesive manner. And that demands work. Multiculturalism is this wonderful thing that has given us huge amounts in this country, but it takes work. And, and I think it's one of the challenges for the, the current government is, you know, I think lots of people are now looking at the current Labour government and asking, what are we going to be hearing and very soon, hopefully, about a social cohesion strategy? We can talk about the far right. We should talk about the dangers and, and the, the role of the far right in this. But we are seeing hundreds of people coming out onto the streets, as I say, many of which aren't in any way identified formally to the far right, but they do have issues around prejudice, discrimination. They are using far right language and they do hold far right beliefs. But we have to find a way to make sure that these communities can come together so that next time there is a horrifying tragedy, like what we saw in Southport on Monday, we don't see a repeat of this. And do you think we in some people online would call us the mainstream media, do you think we have a level of responsibility in the fact that we struggle sometimes to properly report on and try to understand some of the divisions that have been festering in our communities. We just ignore it to some extent. And in that way, we've left a bit of a vacuum for others like Tommy Robinson to come in and exploit them and stoke these tensions. I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think the role of the mainstream media in this, of course, is fundamentally important. Everyone within the mainstream, including politicians, especially around the language that people use, the way that we describe events, the way that we talk about people. I mean, one of the best examples of this would be Nigel Farage, for example. We see a video come out in the last few days from Nigel Farage specifically discussing the events in Southport and spreading misinformation and disinformation, phrasing it as asking questions, but amplifying conspiracy theories about the attacker in Southport. The far right might create the misinformation and disinformation. But the reason that people believe it and then act on it and go out and try and attack a mosque in Southport is in large part because of the rhetoric and the information that they're hearing from the mainstream of British politics, not just the far right. Just finally, I've been trying to think about how to ask this question because it's a question that we never really ask. It's almost, you know, become a, a bit taboo to even go there. You see these people on the streets, clearly they're part of a far right movement. Clearly there's a lot of undercurrents of racism going on there. But is it worth actually trying to understand some of the concerns that these people have? Is there any value in trying to get at uh, some of the maybe more complex concerns. Why are so many people so angry? Why are so many people able to be exploited by conspiracy theories online? Yeah, it's a fundamental. Lots of people in this country are really angry. 
whether or not that's the cost of living crisis, stagnant living standards, whether or not it's the state of their communities, whether or not it's the state of their infrastructure and houses and schools and hospitals, they are angry and they are right to be angry. Now, some of those people are articulating that anger in a way that is unacceptable. They are listening to far-right messaging, which offers really simple answers to very, very complex questions. And that resulted in an othering, the reason that they are blaming the wrong people for what's happening to their lives. But that doesn't mean that they're not right to be angry. And until politicians start to meet the material needs of those communities and those people that live in those communities, they are going to be susceptible to the politics of hatred. They're going to be susceptible to far-right individuals that are going to prey on them. That's all for today. I'm Liz Bates, and I'll be back again tomorrow.